Hello, hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Take your seats, even though it's very cozy at the bar. I know, I know, I know. Uh, and I know as well that on a day like today, there are a lot of interesting topics uh, to discuss. Belgian football, uh, Brussels atmosphere, but this is it. This is the most urgent and most interesting talk you'll hear all day. My name is Michel Cuvelier. I'm a radio host for Studio Brussel. Um, I'm a music lover as well. I'm a concert goer as well. And however small my role may be in the bigger scheme of things, we all have a role to play in the music industry. Uh, whether we're buying tickets, whether we're organizing a tour, whether we're selling tickets. So first and foremost, let me paint you a picture. Our planet is not doing well, obviously. Keeping global warming beneath 1.5 degrees is becoming more and more challenging, especially when climate summits uh, turn out to be rather disappointing. So the time is very much now. What are we going to do now for the next 90 minutes? We're going to talk about worms in concert halls, ecological riders, greener concert tickets, and what the government can do. And I want to ask your questions. So if you have a question during these 90 minutes, uh, if you're in a seat here at the AB, you can pop the question after uh, in the Q&A. But if you're watching online, you can uh, submit your question uh, in the comment section and we'll be able to ask some of those as well. Um, we're going to start off with a Skype conversation I had with Jamal Chalabi. He is the tour and production manager of Massive Attack of Bring Me the Horizon, amongst others. He's also a member of the tour production group and head of a greener tour within a greener festival, uh, the British non-profit organization that Claire co-founded, Claire, who's here as well. Um, so welcome to those who just joined us and let's watch the Skype. Hi, Jamal. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, thanks. Thanks. Uh, great to be here. Yeah, uh, virtually. Thank you so much for making time. Um, for those who don't have the honor of knowing you and everything that you do, could you give us uh, an introduction? Who are you? What drives you? And what do you do on a daily basis? Um, well, first and foremost, I'm not sure it's an honor, but very, very kind of you. Um, <laughs> I am, um, my name is Jamal, Jamal Chalabi. I have been a tour manager and production manager for uh, over 25 years. Um, I have, you know, traveled the world doing uh, live, uh, live uh, productions at, at every level. Um, and I, during the pandemic, uh, which was a bit of a watershed for everybody, it was a bit of a, you know, sit down moment and take recollection. Um, I joined a group called uh, the Tour and Production Group which was a collection of tour and production managers who got together on a weekly basis to discuss the state of the industry. Um, we initially started talking about COVID-19 and how we would go back uh, to the industry and live performances and live events um, under, under COVID-19. And we ended up writing the document um, for, uh, which was accepted by government, by the DCMS, um, which now stands as the basis for all the COVID-19 compliance officers. So that was how we came together on the tour and production group. And we also, doing that, there was a lot of big names, far, far bigger and more important tour manager and production manager than I. And we felt that we wanted to um, start looking at the industry as, as a whole, because there are so many things that, that could be done better. Um, first and foremost was mental health and welfare, um, obviously with a focus on addiction and you know, sustainability within you know, human resources, which was really key. Um, equality, diversion, inclusion, which was huge. Really trying to make the industry not, not so much the white wall, um, but bringing it up and getting it far more diverse, which was which was really really key. Um, and then sustainability. Um, ironically, sustainability looks after all those things. It looks after pandemics. It encompasses equality, diversity, and inclusion, uh, mental health and welfare, social justice. You get sustainability right, and you get a plethora of other issues right as well so so that's so that's that was slightly ironic um i took up the the baton of uh, sustainability um and which is kind of why I'm, where i am now you're also playing a huge role in the tours of and i'm just gonna uh, drop some names uh, a few of the many bring me the horizon massive attacks you actively make those tours more and more sustainable um could you, um, let's, let's just take the case of Bring Me the Horizon, could you tell me specifically um, which steps you took um, to make that tour more sustainable? Well, well thank you. And I, um, my role is, again, really just in, the, I think the thing, the thing, the thing about the, 
the Bring Me the Horizon thing, it was very much, what was fascinating about that is the way I approached it was to reach out to all the stakeholders. Um, a lot of people uh, go around, oh, well, it's the band, if the bands get on board, it's really about the, it's not really about the artist, it's about the industry itself. And who are the stakeholders? Well, that's the, so the stakeholders were really, it was the agent, it was the promoter, yeah. it was the venue, and it was management. So I reached out. Yeah, so, and, and those are the, the key people that we wanted to get on board. The agent, you know, and what I said, to, what I, I proposed to them is that we would obviously mitigate, i.e. we would reduce the carbon footprint, um, and we'd also calculate as well. Getting the stakeholders to contribute to that and seeing that as, was a real positive step. So it wasn't just, oh, it came from the artist, but it all came down from, you know, from all the major players, but also the very fact that the O2 um, AG Arena also contributed to as well. And, and you know, who, in a, in, in on a side note, the O2 Arena are doing some f phenomenal things on, on the venue side as well. So, sure? so yeah, there was there was lots and lots of going on. So um, to, to discuss what we did with the Bring Me Horizon, it, it, you can really break it down into what I like to call the Holy Trinity. Um, and that really is power, uh, travel and transport, and, and food. So those are the real things, that you, the, the three things that you need to have a look at and make sure you, you know, and they break down into everything that we do. So the first thing we did with Bring Me Horizon was we looked at, you know, the, um, our power. So we, the, the, we, our lighting design. So instead of using all the, the usual fixtures, we, all of the, all bar one fixture was LED. Um, so if, if you if you used all LED, you're in, you're liable to reduce your carbon footprint or your power draw around about 95% from old fixtures to new fixtures. So you can reduce the amount of power that you you were drawing. So that we that's that's one of the things we did. And um, we also looked to, at uh, to make sure that the, um, you know we were the the audio system we we're using was very very efficient as well on the power system as well we also metered our power as well which is very which is also key the reason i say that we metered our power is that most bands well all the bands at the moment you know tell when they go to a festival they just tell the, the festival the size of their plug sockets and not the actual draw um so this in, in what what the what happens then is the festival will then go away and match its its the amount of generator it needs against the size of the plug socket and not the actual power that it actually needs. So we're over specking our festivals enormously. But that's again another story we can talk about. Um, so I'm bringing the horizon. We made up uh, 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 the power as, as efficient as we possibly could. Um, we then looked at travel. Um, this was an interesting one. Obviously, transport was the really really big thing. Um, and, and the massive thing we did there was switch up to HVO fuel on the trucks. With once we'd done to that, we were reducing our carbon footprint to between about 85 to 90 percent on the trucks as well, which was a massive, massive saving. Um, so that was really, really key. And then the next thing we looked at was the food. We reduced our single-use plastics, no single-use plastics at all. We just got, got water fountains everywhere with those massive bottles, which are all recyclable. So that was really key. Everybody bought their, their own water bottle. It wasn't a difficult move, and it should be just something that people are just doing now. It's not hard. Um, so that was something we did. I think we, we reduced across the six shows, we reduced the amount of plastic bottles, I think in the region of 4,000 no, no, single-use plastics across the six shows. Um, the other key thing we did was on the, the food and catering. Uh, what we did there was we made the meat eater the odd one out as it as it as it were yeah. so instead you know it's like when you're a vegetarian you get on a plane it's like did you order your vegetarian food to oh i'm so sorry would you like a bread roll you know that's the way we kind of flipped it so we had an all plant-based menu um and uh, and if you wanted meat you could order it as a special order so it was like an aside um but the, the key thing on that was we did pre-orders um which allowed we would we'd sent out a job form simple job form document um, that would allow the, the caterers to get the numbers right the day before. So when they went into ordering, they all obviously ordered local food, local produce, but they could reduce the amount they were ordering because they didn't have to make so many meals across so many different menus because we had the accurate numbers of what we had. And that's not a difficult thing, you know, and, and you know, it, everyone's, everyone lives on their phones and their apps nowadays. 
So it's very much something they're used to. Everyone's using master tour, blah, blah, blah. So really, really easy to do that. And also for the caterers on, on tour, for them to have their menus set ahead of time uh, for, for the tour should be something they should be standard. So it should be something that is easily planable, easily doable, runs, makes things run more efficiently, saves on waste, and, and again, reduces carbon footprint. Um, so that, that's really good. I think tech is really, really key here because tech will help us move the dial and that simple things like a you know a nap for, for a menu like a the talk the master tour etc etc those things really really help um so yeah and also at the end of the day we also um upcycled our uh, our meals as well we you know we would have them collected we would make sure that any overage any overages were wasted or thrown away um and that was sent up i just have so many questions um i'm going to ask a practical one the price tag of all those. The price tag, again, this is, this is everyone's first and foremost answer. It's never your problem, and it's always going to cost you more money. That's, that's a simple yeah. answer. It's like, why, yeah. why switch to an electric vehicle? Because the, well, it's, the cars are really expensive and the network's not there. So, you know, it, it's like saying, well, I'm going to continue to um, invest in the fossil fuel industry uh, because there's, I don't have an option. You do have an option. The point is everybody needs to invest and bite the bullet and invest in new tech and the new direction and the electric highways. So, so you have to do that. But to be perfectly honest, as I've intimated before on the cost, if everybody gets on board there with this and the whole infrastructure changes, it will start saving us all money. It's saving, you know, if I can talk about the venues, it's saving venues money already. They've gone to, to the green grid. In the UK, we've done very well by switching to the green grid. So, you know, we have, I think, 65%, 60% of our, our electricity, our grid, is green. So that is saving us money. We're not, we, you know, and again, it's uh, with the advent of war in Ukraine, with the you know, raising fuel prices, it's totally making sense now that we have to switch to green energy. We have to switch to renewables. That's where you're saving money. Again, it's not about, you, you can look at it in a short term, but you have to look at it, you know, you've got to have the, the Asian mindset. You can't look at it just for the next quarter, the next two quarters. The next, you've got to look at the next five years, the next 25 years, because that's where the investment really is. Exactly. I'm just also thinking uh, as a smaller artist, you know, the, the, the up and coming uh, little Belgian uh, duo that just likes to tour Europe but can't afford, uh, you know, train tickets because they're so much more expensive than plane tickets and all those, because it's, it's, the, it's the, yeah, it costs more to go the extra mile. So it's actually the, the train tickets, I've done that. And I actually think the train tickets are actually cheaper. I, I've been to, uh, yeah, I, I found that, yeah, I found them a, a lot cheaper, a lot more efficient. And again, there's, there's, it's from case to case. Um, but you, so the other, the other thing is you've also got, a, it's not just simple about getting on a plane if you're carrying equipment. I think where the small bands come from, they just have to be smarter. You, nowadays, you don't have to carry enormous amounts of equipment everywhere. Because you can rent. Oh. You, you can rent, you can have that line there, but the other thing is that you, there's, you, you can small carry, you can plan it more efficiently. And also, as far as guitar amps, there's, these, there's new things like Kempners, Kemp, uh, which are literally the side, you, they carry on luggage. And, they, and they, within them, they have every single guitar sound you ever want or every single bass sound. So there's, there's ways of doing this. You just have to be very, very intelligent about it and, and not be precious about what your kit is. The same with the, same with the audio guys. They've got to be very, but they, you know, the audio, it's better to get an audio guy to go and learn how to use five, six, seven separate desks than it is for him to demand to have one particular desk across all this. this thing. So that's the way we flip it. It's, as I said, the, 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 the smaller bands, it's really more about the venues because it's about what the venues can do because they're just really showing up and it, they need to be plugging. The venues need to be, and I did a, a, a 10 pointer on the TPG on this one, which I'm happy to share. Um, and it really is about making sure the venue is on green, green grid making sure that they, there's no single-use plastics, making sure that they have a, a, a policy with their food and beverage partners, making sure that they're, they're, they're vegan, uh, making sure that the, the, the building is efficient, making sure they've got LED, LED lights, making sure that their, their waste management is, is, is properly you know, um, policed, i.e. the local authority are separating their waste and it's going to the right places and is, is being upcycled, etc. Um, um, so yeah, it's, and, or and again, talking to local local government and local authorities about transport. 
you know, encouraging people to use their bikes. And not a problem in Holland and Belgium, I know. But using your bikes or, you know, having trains run later, so all those sort of things. So it's really about, you can talk about what the little band is doing, but they're just showing, they're showing up for one day. Exactly. Where that venue is over the 365 days. So it's about what the venue is doing, what the festival is doing. And so when you say that the O2 in, uh, in the UK is, is doing so well, it's because they're an example? A leading example for all those things that you mentioned. Absolutely, the o, the O2 okay. are doing some amazing work on that. You know, they're, they're with the local authorities, transport-wise, um, also with what they're doing in-house, the way they run their power. Uh, it's green grid, and um, all these things that they're doing. I mean, literally, I could sit here and spend half an hour going through it, all. even down to the point where they have a wormery, where they have. You know, they've got. I think it's. I think they've got. I think it's about ten thousand tiger worms in a wormery. Which Uh, and it's basically these worms they just eat all the, the so they they actually change their their so their digestion this is the first time that i've ever heard the word wormery so i just had to sit and uh, take it in uh, but that's a good thing it means the times are changing <laughs> that i'm learning well, this word. It, these aren't just any these aren't just guy any old guard worms. these are tiger worms tiger worms i'm going to google those <laughs> Um, but look, they're doing amazing things, you know, even down to the production with their rigging as well. You know, they've got in-house up steel, um, top steel, which is really, really key. Um, but yeah, and, and they're working towards, continually working towards reducing their, their carbon footprint. And again, leading a great example. I love to hear it. Um, there are two more questions. Um, no, actually, there are a thousand, but I'm just going to try and narrow it down to two. Um, I want to ask about the biggest um, the biggest um, problems you encountered personally. But first, I want to ask you about, after the venues, the fans, the people that buy the tickets. What can we do, according to you, uh, except, you know, take the bike or the train? The fans and what the fans, that kind of loops into your, into the, 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 your last question as well. Um, But I think that the fans can really just be be aware of this. I think they can they yeah. need to choose with their footprint. They need to choose with their money. They need to choose what festivals they go to. They need to make sure the festivals are doing everything they possibly can. They need to be aware of what the venues are doing. They they need to be aware of what they're doing. You know, it's 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 very very easy to go. Well, there's no choice, but there is always a choice, um, and and that's the real trick. And I, I think they just need to be more aware. of what the festivals and the venues are doing and also what the bands are doing as well. Um, I and and they, they need to be really, it's not just about what they do in the music industry, it's, it's about what they do in every everyday life. This, this isn't just something you do in the evenings when you're listening to music, this is something you need to do every moment of your, your waking, your, 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 your life. Now I'm just thinking as, as you know, the, the regular fan, uh, which I am first and foremost, uh, how, how can I know whether a festival or a concert hall is um is 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 doing enough i'm now i'm thinking in like we have on Bel in belgium we have this this thing called nutri score on products in the supermarket that tells you how nutritious or how good a certain type of food is is it i don't know um should that be inserted in in as labels and colors and uh, for 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 venues This is something that we've been working towards with the Greener Festival because we have obviously a Greener Festival is all about certifying a festival. If you're certified by a Greener Festival, it means that you are uh, a good festival. You are on you're in you're on the road in the right direction um, for you know for sustainability. The same thing goes for venues. There's 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 that, that and also we're we're just starting a, a green supplier, so all the music suppliers will, will have a green certification. Um, but yeah, absolutely, that's that's part of the key. Um, the biggest challenge here is, it's not what we need to do. We all know what we need to do. We need to stop using fossil fuels. We need to reduce the amount of plastic. We need to reduce our waste. We all know what we need to do. It's changing that mindset, and, and that's the where you know why music and what we do is so important, because music can change. You know the emotions that it can change. It crosses borders. It crosses cultures. It crosses religion. It crosses all those barriers and can emotively move that forward. Which is why what we do, what you do, what everybody who's hopefully looking at this does, is why they got into the industry in the first place because it struck a chord. It's it's really really key, and that's why I feel that we're in a good, a great position to influence that cultural change. Um, which is why I'm trying to get the back of house clean so the artists can, you know, push this issue forward. It's, it's almost like, 
you know, the reference of Vietnam, I mean, would, would Vietnam War have been stopped if the music hadn't been so good? You know, yeah. it's, I mean, it was one of the greatest revolutions. It was a TV, a war that was televised and the music around it was just phenomenal. And I, and I think, you know, we need, uh, we need our music today to be more revolutionary and it needs to really push this issue. Thank you so much, Jamal, for the time. If you guys need to, to you know, recap on any of this, I'm happy to revisit yeah. it. Um, but unfortunately, I do have a, a two o'clock I need to jump on to. Definitely. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. 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 Voila. That was an appetizer for everything that's c- to come. And now I'm going to do a very interesting maneuver. There you go. And I'm going to welcome the panel that we have selected for you here tonight. There they are, coming with a glass of water as well. So you'll see some maneuvers that are slightly more elegant than mine. <laughs> but yeah, that was Jamal that we just heard, couldn't make it today. So we Skyped, there's a stairs. Very, (laughs) very wise decision. All right, I'm gonna uh, give everybody sitting next to me uh, the introduction that they deserve because they are experts in their uh, field. We have Claire O'Neill, who is an expert in sustainability in the music industry. She co-founded a Green Festival. Uh, that's the nonprofit uh, from the UK that helps events, tours, and festivals become more green around the globe. So Jamal's a colleague of yours. Um, they have uh, Wanna Scappella, uh, which you might know from uh, the Flemish band It Says de Metal, the sixth metal for everybody who's uh, following <laughs> from a, another uh, part of the world and speaking a different language. You're a pioneering band uh, when it comes to sustainable touring, and you're also an ambassador of the Klimatsak, uh, which hopefully uh, rings a bell because it was very important. Uh, we have also Marlene Boer, uh, head of production of Eurosonic Noorderslag, which is the biggest showcase festival uh, in Europe, in Groningen. Uh, you guys have an impressive list of green ambitions uh, with their green touring support. And we also have an academic mastermind in our midst. <laughs> Johan Ekmans, uh, who is many things, who holds many titles, but he's a professor of environmental economics at the University of Leuven and also a promoter at the Center for Economics and Corporate Sustainability, uh, which is quite impressive, not only uh, spoken out loud, but also on his LinkedIn. Um, we're going, to talk, we're going to talk about uh, the impact, about the problems, uh, solutions and the role of the government when uh, we're talking about um, making the music industry a more green, a more sustainable place. Uh, I've got a couple of questions just uh, as an introduction for all of you, Claire, um, because we just heard uh, Jamal, head of a greener tour within uh, a greener festival. You can take... Ah, your mic is, is, uh, is over here, by the way. It's hidden. Yeah, yeah. There you go. You can all grab your mics so that we can hear you perfectly uh, in the hall and online. By the way, I'm going to add, if you have a question, don't hesitate, drop it in the comments online. Um, So a greener festival, what do you guys do exactly? (laughs) That's a good question. (laughs) Uh, So we started over 15 years ago to try and raise awareness within festivals after seeing how the major festivals that were starting to emerge were huge diesel generators, dirty burger vans, no recycling, no real care for the people that were going, kind of treating people like punters, um, not participants. Um, And then seeing that there was an alternative way to do things with solar-powered sound systems, composting, vegan food, um, recycling, etc. And so uh, we started a greener festival first with a very simple checklist of what could you do. I think it was like maybe 20 questions. Um, And festivals around the world picked it up straight away from like Glastonbury to Bonnaroo in the US and um, Rainbow Serpent in Australia, just from making a website with our our research findings. Um, From there, about 10 years later, I guess we'd started to assess hundreds of festivals all around the world. Um, The the certification process became much more complicated as anyone here can attest pauline is one of our assessors and she's been saying how much time she has to take out to complete them Uh, so we certify events 
We began with the festivals, but then quickly found that the efforts would stop at the um, at the dressing room. Mm -hmm. So we approached one of the major um, agents, which is Coda at the time, then Paradigm, now Wasserman, and um, started the Green Artist Rider. Following that, um, we saw that the artists could go so far, but then they'd hit the wall of a venue. So then we started Greener Arena, where we certify arenas and venues. Um, and then following doing a greener tour, which is when we went out with Bring Me The Horizon, um, we've started to do the greener supplier certification as well. And from the back of these certifications, we do training internationally in sustainable event management um, and accredit universities if they do sustainability in events. Um, we do the Green Events and Innovations Conference, which is its 15th year in February, where the music industry comes together on this very sub subject. Um, we do net zero strategy and carbon um, analysis for the O2, for example, and, and various different types of festivals, events, and consultancy, um, and various other things. We do quite a lot of stuff about sustainability. <laughs> it's amazing. It's admirable. Uh, you. And you're definitely the right person in this very green seat <laughs> to talk about everything that we're going to tackle today. Um, I'm going to uh, take it to Belgium, Wannas, because you're a Belgian artist. We heard the names Bring Me the Horizon, uh, Mass Attack. Coldplay is a very um, known example of what bands can do uh, abroad, but uh, when it comes to Belgium and the Netherlands, uh, can you give a few examples of what you guys personally uh, do to uh, get it more green whilst being on tour? I think our biggest move to uh, make touring greener was uh, not having international success, <laughs> which makes uh, touring uh, much greener. Uh, but f for that part of uh, um, we're um, like since 2014, we decided to uh, only eat vegan on tour, um, um, and well, that, that was because I had decided to uh, start eating vegan, and so I needed to ask someone to to uh, cook on tour. <laughs> And the band was like, okay, your food is much better than the <laughs> food we get. So it it wasn't, it, it didn't feel hard for them. Uh, and uh, we bring our own uh, renewable, uh, re um, reusable bottles. Because our sound technician happens to be uh, uh, Irun Vreke, who, who organized um, Boomtown in Ghent, and he's always been uh, tr uh, trying to make the festival really uh, as sustainable as possible. And he developed uh, a system to get tap water uh, there and, and uh, like lemonades uh, with syrups. And, and he started a business like that, so we really had to uh, like. Have up. yeah, <laughs> we had to have the reusable uh, cups. But I mean, it, that is such a small effort. But still, if you see how many like th uh, plastic bottles are being thrown away at venues or festivals, it's it's huge. Um, but it's exactly that. So we're going to hear a lot of examples of smaller and bigger uh, stuff you can do. But it's all those things. It's the combination, the the drops in the ocean that are going to make a difference. Um, you approach it from a very different uh, point of view as an organizer at Eurosonic, Marlena. Uh, could you tell me something about uh, the program for sustainable touring that you've developed, please? Yeah, so apart from the work that we're doing to make the festival itself more uh, circular or more sustainable, uh, we also want to stimulate artists to uh, tour greener. And so um, actually uh, this was uh, born out of um, we were selling tickets for the Eurosonic 2021 edition when COVID hit. Um, and we were uh, charging a uh, solidarity ecotex, is what we called it, because we know that transport is the, like the biggest thing if, t if, you, if we want to be a more sustainable. And because we are a very international festival, a lot of our guests fly in. Um, and we developed a program in which we wanted to replace uh, the fuel uh, the, uh, the airline fuel that they're using for sustainable airline av aviation fuel. Um, so we wanted to use the Solidarity Ecotex for that, but then COVID hit and nobody flew to Groningen because there wasn't a festival. And then we had this budget and we were thinking, okay, what well, can we do with this budget to use it for uh, the greater good? And then we developed the uh, Eurosonic Green Touring Support, 
Uh, basically, it is if you played your Sonic uh, in a previous edition, you can apply for it. And we uh, pay for the difference between regular touring and green touring. So for instance, if you usually you rent a van, uh, you, you drive to a place, if you want to uh, go by train, this might be more expensive. Or, or if you want to rent back line locally, which might be more expensive than bringing your own, then we pay for the difference in price. Uh, so that we want to um, stimulate artists to think about this and to help them in their way to becoming more sustainable. Definitely. Um, Johan, I'm going to look to you as a scientist um, because we've heard so many wonderful initiatives, bigger ones, smaller ones, uh, very specific ones. How do you look at those measures taken from a scientific point of view? What do you think of the impact? Well, personally, I'm very happy to hear all of these examples and I recognize a bit the yeah, the trajectory that the industry is going through, we see that in many industries. So typically first you start with your own operations. What can we do uh, in terms of uh, your own equipment? Uh, that's the first thing to look at, your own electricity, do we source it green and so on. Uh, that's what we call scope one and scope two emissions. But then the challenging thing is what we call scope three emissions, that is at one hand that is in your supply chain, the sourcing of all your stuff and, and uh, how green is that and can we get it certified. But then the really challenging thing is the downstream part of it that is with your customers, with your clients. So in the music industry, with the people visiting your, your venue or uh, the people even listening through streaming or whatever. And you see that most, um, the most innovative companies are now working on this uh, scope three emissions and especially towards their users, their customers. So I'm happy to hear that uh, you're also looking into schemes to, to get the audience in a greener way to the, to the venue, um, reward them if they take public transport, stop early so they can get back by train, and that, that kind of things is, I think, very important, and that's the way to go further. Actually, let's dive into that aspect that you just addressed, the fans and creating awareness and mobilizing them. Um, as an artist, uh, Wannes, how big of a task uh, do you feel it is for you being the one on stage to uh, be the generator of change in minds and behavior? Well, um, I think we have a, a task there, but um, I, I think it's uh, just, you can ask your audience to come by bike or, or on foot or, or, or share cars, but uh, I've been thinking so much about it, like how, how can we, how can you put that into a system or like, I mean, people that don't live close to a train station, I mean, even if you start, uh, stop early, they they need to get back home. Uh, so it, I think that's that probably the, the most difficult uh, part about uh, touring, because we can eat vegan and ha go in one car instead of four cars. But if, if 500 people come by car to your concert, then, uh, yeah, so... You need help. For example, the AB has a, has a, uh, a strict policy. They, you have to stop playing at 10.30, uh, it was? Yeah, something like that, yeah. So that uh, you can make it to the last train. Madalena, when you heard this, you were surprised. Yeah, I thought it was great. Because it's not the norm in, in the No, Netherlands. it's not the norm. No, we always reason from, from like, the artist or what we are used to doing. And so I live in Groningen, which is all the way up north in Holland. And uh, this is kind of an end station for the trains. So the trains don't go any further because they'll end up in the North Sea. Um, so if you want to get back from Groningen to anywhere else in the Netherlands, you have to be on the train by, I think, 11.26 is the last one. Um, so if you attend a show and they end at 11 and you want to buy a t-shirt and you want to go like have one beer, then you'll miss the last train. Um, which is sad because I think it w it's, it's easy to make a rule and say, okay, 10.30 at the latest and then everybody can get the last train home. I'm going to circle back to uh, the role of the artist on stage in, in, in mobilizing and in creating awareness. I went to the Coldplay concert um, this summer and uh, it started with this um, yeah, a screen 
and on it a, v a video of all the initiatives that they took um, in order to make the tour more green. So as a fan, you're sitting there, you feel quite good <laughs> about yourself. Uh, Claire, from a global point of view, um, even though one has said, you know, we can try what we can try, but we're still, uh, you know, uh, we, we have to depend on, for example, uh, trains and everything. What are things that artists can do um, in order to create this awareness? Well, I think if there's anything that's going to help you to live a more sustainable lifestyle, then if you can demonstrate that and make it the most fun and the most interesting thing to do, if like, people are coming to see their favorite artists because they love them, and a lot of the time they idolize them um, and would be even just open and happy at that moment, they don't want to be lectured and educated because you can't educate anyone that doesn't want to learn about something. Right? So whereas you can inform and you can demonstrate that actually this is the better way to be. I mean, what's, what's less going to be more inspiring, I guess, than seeing something that's actually sustainable, genuinely, like we can have vegan food, we can have an amazing party on renewable energy, and we can not keep on killing ourselves slowly. <laughs> that sounds like the better thing to do good. to me. <laughs> um, but also, I think, um, in the case of Coldplay, they actually had something to say. They'd done something. Um, so therefore, they could say, look, this is what we've done. I didn't see that, so I don't know whether it's something that then people could take away and go, oh, I could do that myself. Actually, not so much. It was really about the tour and that specific ticket that you bought. Mm. So I didn't, yeah. I think actually yeah. a concert or a festival is a great place to educate people because they're happy, they're in a, in a good mood. Mm -hmm. um, and they can try something out. You know, a festival is like one or two or three days out of your life. And then maybe those two or three days you do something different. You eat vegan or you... You're just aware, more aware of these topics. It's a low-key way of educating people and maybe inspiring them to change something in their year-round lives. Yeah, so. I'd say festivals more so than even a single artist on a stage. And that's the reason that we started a Greener Festival in the first place, because you're under the elements. You can actually experience what it's like to not be connected to your light switches and your taps. Um, and now that we're starting to experience huge storms and heat waves, you can experience that firsthand as well and, and know that it's real. Yeah. Most definitely. Um, when, yes, um, go ahead. It reminds me of uh, what you in the interview with Kamal, he, he stressed the importance of the venues because we're talking really about the top bands, but um, yeah, a lot of the, of the activities, of course, in the venues, and they have an important role to play, and that will also, I think, lead to more acceptance with the audience it becomes then the new normal. So Jess, can you give some examples of what you'd like to see happening, or that are happening already in the Belgian uh, Well, the, you gave the example here of uh, thinking about the closing hour. Uh, not so far from here is an opera house that is not doing that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Those opera people <laughs> should start <laughs> earlier, probably, if you want to see uh, the entire Puccini. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's my only opera reference that I can give <laughs> <laughs> because I go to Corpic concerts. Um, but um, since we're talking about, I wanted to pitch in on, yeah, um, uh, using not only the venues and the festivals as um, uh, places where you can really poke people into changing habits. Uh, but also, Marlena, you can testify firsthand uh, when you start uh, uh, the poking with your very own crew. Uh, what happened at Eurosonic and how did it evolve when it comes to food? So we've been in this journey at Eurosonic for um, more than five years now. And one of the scariest changes is we made is that we changed the crew catering to vegetarian crew catering. Not vegan, but just... Not just vegan yet. <laughs> and the first year we, we, uh, we did the soft approach. So we did actually what uh, Jamal also said, is we made meat an, an extra. So the standard was vegetarian. And if you really thought you needed meat, you could ask for it. Uh, and then the next year we made it all vegetarian. And we got a little bit of pushback, especially from like the stage builders and the... Uh, uh, the technical people, they're saying we're working hard, we need to eat like decent food and we don't need to eat cheese all the time. <laughs> we're like, okay, just hear us out, you know, just try it. Um, and it's easier for us because we're in the inner city of Groningen, so if you like really think you're gonna die if you don't eat meat, you can go out and get some meat in the city. 
Um, but actually, some of them were brave enough after the festival to come back to us and say, hey, you know, we tried it and it was actually really good. There were more options than cheese. And um, thank you for doing this. So, yeah. When it comes to the price tag, um, because all of this, uh, it costs more, do you guys think that the client, the people in the room that buy the tickets, are willing, that about able, uh, to pay more? What do you guys think? Well, interestingly, when we did um, the first survey before AGF began, actually, which was 17 years ago, one of the questions was, would you accept a more expensive ticket for the purpose of environmental improvements of a festival? And people said yes, about like 90% of people said yes. This was 17 years ago. Um, now the cost of tickets are so expensive already anyway <laughs> um, that adding more cost on um, is it's a hard ask because the cost of all production has gone up and those costs are going to need to be reflected in the price of the tickets. However, I wouldn't say that being sustainable makes everything more expensive. There's upfront costs, yes, potentially, like especially if you need to put in the resource to make these things happen. Like all that stuff that happened on the Brimley the Horizon tour, like I had to physically be there and make sure it happened. It takes a lot of time and a lot of resources. But if you look at the cost of energy, now if you look at the cost of meat, which should be more expensive actually than plant-based food, it's, and it's a no-brainer. You know, at the end of the day, it's about making efficiencies as well. That you're not creating a huge amount of waste that you then have to dispose of. That it's going to become more and more expensive. In my experience, it's oftentimes it's even cheaper. Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, so we really dove into food waste and we tweaked and tweaked and tweaked. And we saved like 30,000 euros in one year on food waste only. So this means we were doing very bad before. Wow. <laughs> but, um, also but a lot the of myth those of things. The price tag yeah, yeah, it's, is not it's, true. it's partly a myth. Uh, also, if you look into energy, what Jamal was talking about, if you really ask artists, okay, don't give me the plug size, but give me what you actually need. Uh, yeah, you can save a lot of so money. It's really also a matter of contracts. If yeah. you pay per kilowatt hour instead of uh, just having the equipment, that makes a very big difference and that gives incentives to, yeah, to scale down. And it's also in our, uh, the studies that we did in, in the related businesses, we saw that uh, especially transport is a very important emission, but also cost saver. Uh, and so we were a bit yeah, surprised that uh, this low-hanging fruit had not yet been picked because it was even making sense economically to, to, to organize it more efficiently, to basically to avoid some transport, uh, if possible. I think the biggest step we have to take is that people think it's more, it's dif it's more difficult or it's more expensive, which if you really like, um, research it, it's, most of the times it's not. Because we looked at the transportation at Eurosonic in diff at different levels. We use a transport hub, so everybody comes to the artist village, and from there we transport it ourselves on biofuels. Um, and we uh, uh, get our suppliers to combine transport, so they share trucks. At first they didn't want to, uh, but we work together with Peter Schmidt, which is a great partner of ours. They do uh, touring events, but also trucks. And so we told the suppliers, okay, if you don't want to do it yourselves, then we'll send a truck, and we'll, we'll pick it up. And they were like, oh, oh, no, we found it. We find it really scary. Okay, we'll share. And then it worked. So it's just a thought process of people that's not tuned into this yet. But if you force a little bit, you use a little bit of force. A little arm twisting. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of arm twisting, a little bit of threatening, and then... <laughs> and then all turns out fine. Um, I was intrigued with, uh, Johan, what you said about the low-hanging fruit. Um, why is the fruit hanging so low, and what's, what's keeping artists... Uh, and venues well, and all the players from picking it then? You think? It's very often a, a matter of habits and, and you gave these examples and that's a well-known uh, insight in behavioral economics that if you change a default uh, that it's an easy way to uh, to change behavior without resistance. But very often if you ask them people why are you doing it this way? Why are you organizing the power supply with these diesel generators? That is, then they say yeah we always do so. And yeah, the, the other options of uh, having grid power, for example, uh, yeah, it needs a little bit of thinking the first time and a little bit of upfront cost of uh, how do you get a permit for that and, and so on. But then very often it turns out to be cheaper and definitely more sustainable. So it's a matter of doing it the first time. You need people who, who are pushing and uh, yeah, and then it's 
easier than we thought. <laughs> so we decided at Eurosonic that uh, the answer, that's how we always did it, is not a viable answer. So yeah. if you say that, uh, you're out. <laughs> wow, that's good. You're out searching meat somewhere yeah. <laughs> uh, in the city of Hironinge. I want to talk about the, um, the, all these beautiful uh, things and initiatives that we heard, but the exact, exact impact. Can you measure the impact of every little thing that you do. For example, I'm going to look at you, Wallace. You started eating vegan on tour. Can you in any way, as a, as a, uh, a Belgian band, measure what the price difference and environmental difference was? Or it's just a feeling? Well, um, I, yeah, I, I don't measure it, but... Uh, I once read that like if you're eating meat uh, and uh, that's like a hundred percent, then a hundred percent, let's say uh, to CO2. Uh, um, if you start eating vegetarian, you go to eighty percent of your CO2, and if you eat vegan, you go to twenty percent. But that's of course, I mean, it. It's something, but it says a lot maybe about the fact that there are no or in Belgium, not not of a lot of tools as an artist that you have to measure what you do when you have a good idea and good intentions. Yeah, I know, but but everything is so complex. I mean, you can eat vegan food, but w when it comes from the other side of the world, then, I mean, so there's so many factors, so I think it's, it's hard and uh, mm. me as an artist, I don't have the... Um, the, uh, don't always have the knowledge or, or the time to <laughs> calculate. But is it possible to calculate? Yeah, I mean, that's what we spend like almost every day doing with a team of about 10 people <laughs> around the world to look at people's tours and festivals and things. And it is complicated, especially with the food, because when you've got the actual energy or fuel, the scope one or two, then it's a lot easier to calculate. And the further that you get away from that usage and into land use, it becomes more complex. But there are very, very precise size measures out there with different metrics for food in different countries and there's um, LCA metrics as well, life cycle analysis metrics that will look at things like water use, land use, different types of emissions. So you can calculate it but it, it's not something that if you're an artist going out and performing you're not going to be then sitting crunching all your numbers as well. Well you might but it's like you're probably busy. Um, but um, we found on the Bring Me the Horizon tour, for instance, I think we ended up reducing meat by about two thirds because people did still want to go for the chicken when people got stressed, which is another factor that is uh, like a, a barrier to change. Um, but I think it was around about three tons of CO2 that we saved and that were, we reduced the emissions of the trucking by 22 tonnes, just to give you an idea. So it's 22 tonnes on the HVO, three tonnes from reducing the meat by two thirds. Um, and this would have been 55 people eating three meals a day for 18 days. So there'd be a much better way to present those figures, but they're the only ones I can remember. But essentially, it does make a massive reduction. And even if you can't calculate it, you know that by simply stopping the meat and dairy, you're going to save not only money, but also emissions. And it doesn't mean that you need to do any massive infrastructural changes. Um, and it has a trickle-down effect across the board. Uh, yeah, you don't have to do all the calculations yourself. Uh, you can just ask your supplier, tell me, um, what's the impact of your product? And then he has to come up with a number. Uh, and that is also what we see happening in businesses, in, in, in other industries as well, that people, that companies in, ask their suppliers, tell me the sustainability specs of your products. And um, then they realize that if they can't come up with a good number, that they might lose, lose business to competitors who can provide these numbers. So we see a lot of things changing, and it are typically the big actors moving first, putting pressure in the supply chain on... Uh, the smaller actors to move as well. And so in that way, uh, in the end, you don't have to do the calculation, but you can be sure that the other ones did. There are indeed, of course, there is some confusion about all of the standards, and, and uh, you refer to LCA analysis, which is as such a great tool, but it's um, difficult in the sense that it 
it is context, time, and location specific. So it's always a bit different. Eh? Um, electricity in Belgium is not um, is, is quite okay, but uh, it's greener in Iceland and it's much dirtier in, in China. So it depends very much where you are. So especially if you're an international tour, um, it might even be very different in a different location for the same tour. And that makes perhaps the, the thing uh, complicated, but that should not hold you back. And there are some some easy rules like don't eat meat, um, reduce your emissions of transport, especially first look at reduce, uh, that's the first option, and then when you still have to go to biofuels or whatever. Uh, so there are, there are, I think, general rules if you keep them in, in your head. The holy you're trinity fine. that Jamal talked about, transport, yeah. Um, energy, oh, energy food. and food, yeah, most definitely. We um, zoomed in on those and the impacts uh, in this, uh, let's say, first part of uh, what's so interesting. I have so many questions that I can't ask, I'm already bumped, but I want to switch. Whoa, there you go, <laughs> the LED. Uh, <laughs> we got a new, uh, a new um, energy source. Um, I want to tackle the problems, the several problems that, with all these good intentions, that you can encounter. Um, I'm going to throw in. Uh, I'm going to start just start with a with a big one, the music industry. Is it too conservative at times for real change? What do you guys think? I mean, so I find that such a funny question. Is this? Um, I got interviewed by um, this amazing 18-year-old uh, woman, and um, and she was like, "Oh, but you know, is it a bit, you know, conservative? And you know, is it controversial to speak out in the music industry?" And I was like, "What? <laughs> like, are we just from such different generations? Because the music used to be where you'd be radical and actually try and make changes. So, at what point did it?" switch yeah. to even the possibility that it could be conservative what what went wrong <laughs> if that's the case so i don't think it is i think that there's a lot that's being pushed and there's there's a lot that will change through the music industry and it has to perhaps the difference there is music versus industry ah Mm. It would, you, what do you mean with that? So the industry, which is now, I mean, a lot of the industry is owned by, for instance, Live Nation or big multinational, like purely solely money driven um, systems. And therefore it fits very much into a patriarchal money driven system that doesn't really look at values. <laughs> Sorry, Live Nation, but you know what you are. <laughs> um, and... Um, Whereas the people who are within the industry who are passionate and creative and want to make a change, I think, are very much not conservative at all. I want to double check that, in the, uh, if I can, with the artists that you receive um, at Eurosonic, which is mostly young, up-and-coming artists that are there to show themselves to the world. Um, do you, what do you, from the organisation point of view, notice when it comes to those artists, the new generation, are they asking for different things? Um, do you notice something in their mentality? What is their perspective? I think definitely the newer generations are all on board with this, because this is our world and their world. I count myself in the younger generations. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and I think we really all feel like the the need and the urge to do something now. And I think that like the bigger, like the Coldplay thing, uh, they're not 100% green, but they're really communicative about it. They're, and so they are inspiring a lot of people. And the live nations of these, the, the, the old world, like they're, they're holding on to the old values, but they, they can't really keep that up for much longer. They're going to have to, and they will. And when will that happen, do you think? What's the, the turning point? Well, I think Europe is breathing down their neck. <laughs> and also, <laughs> so to be fair, they are doing green nation, and, and it's become a competitive issue. So, so when it becomes competitive, it's like actually we need we need to be keeping up on this one, being on the front yeah. foot. Then, then things get invested and things do happen. And I think actually the audiences are also asking questions about it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you have to have your story ready about what are you doing to be more sustainable. Uh, yeah, yeah. You mean vocal like on their social media or what? Yeah, how or do they just feel the they, they want to see something in your FAQ about what are you doing to be more sustainable. Yeah, yeah. And uh, these are very good questions. And, and in the end also shareholders. So we see more and more now in the financial industry, especially also in Europe, um, with certifications that um, it starts to matter also to fin financiers uh, what's going on with their money. 
So that will put a lot of pressure also on the old players, I think, as well. Let's zoom in on the... No, you wanted to say something. Could yeah, you? you asked me about the artist and I just realized I didn't really answer your question. But it was interesting. It was interesting. Uh, um, and also, yes, you answered it because you say that there is a lot of... Um, um, there's an active attitude when yeah. uh, noticeable in the younger generation of artists that you receive. Yeah. And in their fans, who are also younger. As we all are, we're all so young. <laughs> um, I want to ask you, Anas, about how you feel in the Belgian industry specifically when you look at your peers. Um, how, how much of the old mentality is there versus a new uh, approach within your colleagues, the Belgian artists? Well, I'm, I'm um, often frustrated. Uh, because I always feel that changes go way too slow. Um, so I'm often surprised like how like something really easy and small, also like uh, Jamal said, like using <laughs> just a reusable uh, can to drink water is so easy. And it's still most of the bands are still just grabbing plastic bottles and throw them away and and like use five bottles uh, on stage because and they sip from this one and and so I sometimes feel frustrated about those small things or like festivals uh, offering uh, for all the artists like steak uh, I mean that's like wow I, are you really serious about this and uh, it's probably meant like very like welcoming and and all that but it's like yeah so i think there's uh, there's a way to go yeah is that a belgian thing or do you encounter that uh, claire from your uh, experience elsewhere as well that it goes so slowly and that there are a lot of bands that just don't think about their bottles and their steaks yeah, I think definitely it's um, it can be painfully slow in some cases. But the thing is, th things are shifting on quite a global scale now and on a macro scale. So as the energy systems are changing and as the procurements of entire countries start to change and the transport systems change, then we're going to benefit from that. Um, but we can't just let, sit and wait for it because we've got a real... Um, I suppose, what's the word? Responsibility and advantage of having a voice that people will listen to, um, because not many sectors do. Like that, you know, I mean, maybe the finance sector actually, <laughs> they've got quite good voice in a different way. Um, but um, it's something that we need to work ha like hand in hand. So you were talking about earlier the venues closing early so that you can get the train. Put on later trains and stay open later. What, like, why is the opera staying open later than the rock and roll concerts? What's going on? It's like all messed up. Um, but also, if you need to change behaviours and you've got people coming into gigs, then like, if you want to change a city's way of mobility, for example, if you can get someone like Billie Eilish or, you know, and be like, we're going to do this differently this time and trial this new system, um, then the local authorities working with the artists, working with the venues, and then putting pressure on the national governments to be like, we need some cash <laughs> to be able to do this, because they're all being squeezed. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to move much more quickly now. You can see that it's like the, that push. I mean, I started pushing 17 years ago. <laughs> some people have been pushing for decades, and still, like, you know, the recent, like, last five years, it's been a phenomenal exponential growth, I'd say. That's amazing. How big is the role of, um, I'm going to throw in COVID in here. <laughs> How big is the role of COVID and a national, uh, international crisis like that to change mindsets? Does it play a role or was it something else that was already uh, shifting in the background? I'd, there was thing, things were already changing, but something that really stuck in my mind was we did the Green Events and Innovations Conference and it was just a week or two before the lockdown in the UK. And we had a panel about green touring, and um, and they were talking about um, how much of what you can get a headline artist to do, like what's acceptable and what's reasonable. And I was thinking, like, it's as if we've got a choice. <laughs> there isn't actually a choice about like, do we keep an ecosystem that functions, or are we going to um, 
let these concerts go on late so that you miss all the trains, for example, like small example. And then two weeks later, every concert in the world, every festival was shut down, all flights were grounded. And it's like, actually, when the environment gets to this state, then we're not the top of the pecking order. Suddenly, that artist demands are not important anymore because it's just, just not going to happen. And I think that that psychological shift or the potential to realize that you're not the top of the chain, you're not the king of the castle, <laughs> you're part of an ecosystem that completely depends on a functioning ecosystem. You know? So I think that that was one of the biggest shifts to see that actually it can be stopped and it can be done differently. Which was a shocking realization for most of us <laughs> that we were not the top of the pecking order. Mm. Um, and uh, also we got to sit at home and think mm. for two years. And we really uh, like re-evaluated what we were doing and why and how. So yeah, I think it helped. Uh, since we're talking or trying to talk, I try to, um, because it's so interesting, oh my God, I try to uh, keep a certain structure. Uh, we're talking about problems that you encounter. Um, you got to sit home and think during the COVID era. Uh, it was very humbling in a way. And at the same time, coming out of it, the entire industry um, faced the, the very specific challenge, loss of staff, for example. Lots and lots of people went and searched uh, other uh, professions. When it comes to um, green ambitions and making changes, for a venue, for example, that lost half of their staff after COVID, how can they manage from a financial point of view when everything's expensive? Let's not forget the the energy bills, how how can they still keep the green ambitions on top of the list and not drown in all these other very practical problems after COVID? Yeah, it is. I mean, on a practical level, the resource issues this year have been really difficult, especially because loads of gigs that were supposed to happen yeah. all got pushed back. So the last year that happened in particular was very overcrowded. Um, and then, for instance, trying to order certain types of kit for festivals wasn't possible because they simply didn't have the supply. Um, or there are big pressures on staff that then increase the stress levels that then makes the ability to, to change habits much more difficult. Um, but I feel like this was just a symptom and it's not like a fundamental issue. Um, and actually we'll find, find our feet again. But as far as the venues are concerned, we've had more venues since the pandemic come to work with us than we ever did before. And that's because energy is really expensive. <laughs> um, and also because, like you said, people have had time to reflect since things stopping. People don't want to do things the way that they did before. And that's from the audience through to the artists. Um, so it's making economic sense. It's making sense to keep, uh, it's become a competitive issue <laughs> as much as anything, as well as an economic benefit to improve. Um, we've been doing a lot of investment grade energy audits. So looking into venues to see how can you actually strip out some of the things that you've got in there and replace them with more energy efficient elements. Um, and that's become much more popular because of the fact that it's more expensive to burn the energy. When it comes to reflection after COVID as an artist, did you almost come out of the uh, crisis with uh, different ideas for the next Tatsuzi Metal tour? Um, well, uh, I've, I've uh, been thinking also about um, something that, like merchandise, for example. Um, I was talking to uh, um, a woman who's owning a second-hand shop and she was uh, uh, thinking about buying a machine that she can print on t-shirts and so I was thinking why why don't we sell second-hand t-shirts uh, from the band and like all different t-shirts but with a, a band uh, logo on it or, or something like that uh, which I thought it was an interesting thing, but I haven't uh, put it into action. I haven't put it into action. Sounds quite awesome. Yeah. You should do it. Yeah. Are yeah. There, d on an international scale, just this concrete uh, uh, example, are, are there other bands uh, internationally that, that have this type of ideas? I've heard of um, there's a group called the Triplets, I think they are, but they are the ones actually doing the screen printing. And the way that they do it is they say, bring your old stuff 
that you want to revive and so people can bring in their own uh, like clothes and then you can put the logos on them. Okay, that's even uh, more clever. Yeah. It's but, if you, but if you use your oh. own old t-shirts, then it could be even more valuable. Yeah. <laughs> it's already in, your, in the right size. <laughs> It's nice, it's creative. We took uh, actually a little step. We don't do like secondhand or bring your own shirts, but we do a merchandise on demand. So we don't do anything up front. Well, we have some examples and then you can order it and, and uh, you can get it during the festival if you stay for a couple of days, but we don't have anything printed up front. So we don't do it demand on demand only. So less room for spontaneity, but you save more. Yes, that's, that's good. Uh, I love these very practical... Uh, Little things, uh, I love it. Uh, those, uh, do they often, in your experience, come from the artists themselves, or do you guys have um, tour offices or creatives at a greener festival that constantly think about these uh, little things? It comes from everywhere, actually, because we we started with festivals specifically, so it was festival promoters, and we had a mixture of festivals get in touch who were either um, already doing a lot and wanted to share, or they want, or they wanted to learn. And this is um, globally as well, so you get very different approaches, different cultures, different perspectives, and different resources as well. Um, and so from we, we assess like, hundreds of events in the year, and each of those will have different solutions and ideas, and then people always get in touch with us as well. So we haven't got a team of like, in, like innovative, creative, sitting, working away, although we do have ideas ourselves sometimes. But a lot of it is shared, shared experience which is why it's so important to speak about what you're doing as well. Which has also been a, a big change in the music industry is that we talk to each other and we share like the knowledge and the secrets and the, because we all feel it's necessary. Mm. And so you get so much further if you just talk about it. Just talking to these people is very inspiring. Yeah, I feel um. the same. And it, I can't make a real difference except, you know, bring my T-shirt to the next Cesar Metal <laughs> concert and waiting for somebody to stamp it with your, <laughs> with your, uh, uh, yeah, stamp thing. Not an expert here. Um, I want to dive into um, the feelings aside from the facts. Um, there's uh, an artist, the singer of the Weather Station. Uh, this summer there was a wonderful Whisper Festival in, uh, in Belgium, which is really all about um, reflection. And he used uh, the expression climate depression and anxiety. Um, you're all standing on the barricades, you're all going for it. Um, but how often do you guys encounter this, you know, climate anxiety, climate depression? How Exhausting is it actually to uh, to be on those barricades again and again? Well, um, it's not from the music industry, but from my industry, the academic world and teaching. So if you teach about environment and climate, uh, many of my colleagues, we had a very bad feeling. We are ending our lectures in a kind of pessimistic state and we can't leave our students like that. So we have to give also uh, signs of hope and, and there are plenty of that. So there is some kind of awareness that we, uh, that we uh, in the end, there is also a positive wrap up about uh, green energy is getting cheaper and so on. So there, is, there are lots of good things and that's very important, I think. Because if, if people uh, are lost in this pessimistic mood, then they are not willing to change anymore. So you really have to reward also the ones who are doing well, even if you perhaps, if you really look at it, perhaps what they changed is not such a, so effective in terms of how many tons they save, but it's very important to have them on board and to have a positive feeling about that. And I think there also the music industry can, can help a lot. Um, I think um, there's there's a few different ways that I could. Generally, I'm not that anxious or upset or worried at all. It's really good fun actually to be um, fighting and winning. <laughs> um, at some, well, but when, you do when have you the win. feeling that you're winning. That yeah, that's important. Yeah, exactly. And, and the wins are worthwhile because it's not just for your self gratification. It's actually for something that you really care about. But the one thing that is um, like bearing in mind as well for some people this isn't something that's going to happen in the future it's something that's already happened so people have already lost their lives from climate change and you can't just like brush that off as nothing that you do have to recognize that and have respect for that um, but also 
it's I think it's amazing like to be in an opportunity to translate to come out of a nightmare actually like to have found yourself tangled up in a nightmare system and then be able to transform it into something that's really very like, abundant and beautiful um, and what's possible there's um there's an amazing woman who I always talk about called Pat McKay Patricia McCarby and she's from um, the Diné uh, people uh, indigenous elder uh, from the US not the US, and uh, she said that there's so much fear around the potential to change, like the things that we're going to need to change and what we're going to have to do. She's like, but I don't think that it's going to be scary or fearful at all. It's actually going to be deeply satisfying. I imagine the experience of being a human being living actually in harmony with the rest of everything else and with each other. Like, That's great. How could you feel sad about that? And I like, just not put all of your essence into fighting for it. I love hearing you uh, talk like this. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, climate depression, even though it's impossible to feel it after this. <laughs> Is it something that you guys uh, encounter as well at times? Sometimes I have two little girls and I sometimes I wonder what world they will live in 50 years from now. But um, at the same time, I try and focus on the now and on the, on the next few years and I try to, to gain a maximum effort. And I find a lot of joy and a lot of peace in knowing that I am surrounded with a lot of people that are finding the same battle. Everywhere I look, I find people that are just really acknowledging that we need to do everything we can and that they are doing just this. So this is very comforting. And I think we'll make it. <laughs> um, my brother is, a, is an expert in sustainable energy and uh, when I get, like, uh, the other day I got so frustrated about, like, how things change so slowly. And he said actually something a bit hopeful, uh, because the flip side of, of the coin, if we're changing so slowly, that also means, if, if we would, uh, let's say, like, 20 years ago and we we would as humanity have decided okay we need to have uh, solar panels uh, everywhere. everywhere then we would have like been stuck with solar panels of 20 years ago while the <laughs> the solar panels now are much more efficient and so our like slowliness is is also could also maybe yeah, save us <laughs> in some way. That's nice. Uh, yeah, I'm going to remember this. Uh. <laughs> Sometimes slow is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, I, if I may uh, add something about uh, psychology and, and behavioral economics, um, this showing people that they are doing good is really uh, giving good incentives. Eh? And we, have, we see a lot of examples of that in other areas as well. You have a, quite some bike lanes here where you see a counter. Uh, how many bikes have already passed there in the, in the last uh, day, year, and so on. That gives people a good feeling and uh, that uh, confirms them that they are doing well and that they are contributing to that. And I think there are lots of possibilities also in event management in, in, in the music industry also to use this, yeah, this, this uh, psychological insights to yeah, get the feelings right. I'm going to throw in Coldplay again. I went to the tour on bike and I got a little button. <laughs> and it, I felt really good about the button. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an example yeah. of behavioral economics yeah. uh, in the flesh. Um, let's shift to the government. I'm going to start with, with this, what you say, with the rewarding system, before we go and talk about what the government could prohibit in order to make things more sustainable. Um, how can governments uh, enhance uh, the awareness in the industry, but uh, with the, the general public as well, do you think? Well, that's a very broad question. I know, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, at the one hand, I think, uh, especially here in Europe, um, there is a lot going on, especially we have an emission trading scheme that captures 40% of our emissions, especially about energy. So if you buy electricity, there is yeah, taking some in to, into account the cost of carbon to some extent and so on. Um, so things are happening. You can say it's going too slowly. Definitely it's going too slowly if you see uh, how, how little time we have before we hit uh, 1.5 or 2 degrees. 
But um, I find we also have to be a little bit careful with not shifting too much of responsibility to the consumer. Yeah. Um, and I think also the government needs to step in in particular areas. Um, I saw uh, also some people pleading for, for, for labeling. I think that should happen anyway, but it does not necessarily have to be the government that does the labeling because there are other organizations who are, who are doing that and are doing that well. And labeling is important because um, we talked a bit about our consumers willing to pay more. We, we often see in our, research, in our research, indeed, they want to pay a little bit more, but they want to be sure that it's not greenwashing. So, and then labeling can help to inform them that it's indeed not greenwashing, and then they're happy to pay the surplus. Uh, and if you don't have the labeling, then they don't want to pay the surplus, but then also for the organizer, um, he can't uh, make a living out of it. Uh, uh, he can't afford these additional steps if they're more expensive. So labeling can be important, but it does not necessarily have to be the government who does it. They can over, overlook it and uh, yeah, have a kind of uh, quality insurance system. But uh, a lot can happen in the industry as well. As, as I learned also tonight, there is happening a lot in terms of labeling and comparing uh, uh, big concerts and venues. But it is handy if we're talking about labels uh, from, from red to green when it comes to a concert, a tour, a venue, a festival. As a consumer, shouldn't that be supervised? So that it's it's a it's a general thing because I heard you say that maybe it's not the government that should be doing this. Other people can do this. Who are the other people or organisations? And shouldn't it be universal then, not only in Belgium but across well, the globe? A lot of uh, these labels also in organic food and so are um, come up from private organisations mm -hmm. or NGOs, uh, and they make sure uh, that they have their own quality insurance uh, with consultants and so on. And yeah, we see also some competition in the industry. So in the beginning, you see typically a lot of labels, and some of them are not that green. But after a while, they also disappear. And um, yeah, in, it, there is also quite some legislation, also new uh, legal legislation, that is uh, making it more difficult to put forward in advertising green claims if they are not really green. So things are changing also in that respect. You can't get away with any claim you want anymore in an, in an ad. Okay. So, and that will help, I think, as well. Okay, labeling, not necessarily a task of the government. Um, what that's you, that's yeah. what we do as well, we, yeah. uh, on a global scale. So putting those kind of measures from, we, we don't tend to publish who fails. <laughs> we try to teach them to do better. Um, but for the ones that get the grades, that is essentially what we're doing. We're labeling them. And those festivals, how do they, um, uh, how can somebody, for example, who wants to go to a certain festival uh, know which kind of label they're dealing with? Uh, well, they'd need to, the festival would need to present it. Yes. But what the difference is, is that it's not compulsory. So you, mm -hmm. any festival can just decide to not participate. Yeah. And that's the difference with the government. And we had in the UK, um, talking of what the governments could do on a music industry level, the DCMS, the Department for Culture, Media and Sports, I think it is, um, said, oh, maybe we should do licensing, um, green licensing yes. requirements. Um, the industry pushed back because they never want to have extra licensing requirements. Um, but it also, again, falls back onto the local authorities and the government themselves. Like, if you want a festival to be run on renewable energy mm -hmm. and to have like a, close, a, a circular economy approach to all of their materials and have sustainable food offered, then you need to have a national food system that's supporting sustainable food and agriculture. You need to have a green energy grid and you need to have a public transport network. Because if you don't have those, how can you expect a festival to just miraculously create that yes. <laughs> from thin air? But as as far as what the governments can do on a, a larger scale as well is we talked about the cost of trains earlier compared to flying for example i know i've spent hundreds coming to groningen like by train before when i could have spent 60 quid on a flight um, and these are all things that can be either subsidized or taxed and then the planning permissions that are allowed for certain developments such as renewable energy installations or whether you can put a road somewhere versus a new train line etc this is all the stuff that the government are in control of and that's where they need to be pulling their finger out basically it's a mess in the uk at the moment 
hopefully we'll get a new government soon. And that's, of course, not specific to the music industry, but it's uh, beneficial to all industries that there is this uh, network infrastructure that trains are running on time and uh, late enough and are affordable and so on. So that is indeed, that is, of course, a core business of, of the government. Uh, so I agree on that. My point was only on the labeling, whether do they, do they have to step in in the labeling there? I think mm -hmm. not always, but the rest, that, has, that is definitely a core task of the government. How about um, uh, financial efforts when it comes to uh, supporting sustainability? Uh, I'm going to look at Belgium specifically. Are uh, the Belgian governments helping enough when it comes to... Uh, I'm going to look at you, Johan, for the most part of this. Are they helping enough? Well. Um, you're asking an economist, and uh, we as economists, we are thinking about prices. And so we want uh, prices to reflect the real total cost to society of activities. So we are more in favor of taxing than, uh, or I, let me call it pricing, that doesn't sound so, uh, so negative, um, than in terms of sub subsidies, because subsidies sounds nice, but subsidies are expensive in the sense that first you have to collect the money from another tax, labor taxes typically, um, and secondly, um, you might give subsidies for green transport, but it still is a subsidy for mobility and transport. So the underlying consumption activity is also stimulated. We do it, we do it greener, but we still do it too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and that's not what you have with the taxation scheme, because there you give an incentive to switch to greener, but you also have an incentive to push down a bit the demand for some of these activities. So we are more in favor of pricing and taxes than in terms of uh, subsidies, although there is a role for subsidies for uh, particular forms of innovation. Uh, the first movers or uh, the ones who are developing the new standards and so on, there might be some role for subsidies, I think. I think we should, we actually more need uh, the practical help of the government than the financial help. Because a lot of innovations are now, like, um, uh, I, I can't place a battery at my festival because of the uh, regulations. Mm -hmm. And we know that it can be done and it is safe to do it and we take all the measurements to make sure it's safe and then the local fire department won't allow it. Um, this, this is just one example of many, many examples where we, um, yeah, we try to have a conversation with the local government and uh, we, we try to do everything right and then, uh, yeah, we get, they, they push the brakes. On, uh, on things like this. So in Groningen, we now actually just recently um, started a collaboration with the f four major festivals in Groningen, uh, which we are part of, um, to take a stand together uh, in a conversation with the local government to make these things possible. But I would much rather like them to like think and act with us on this than to give us more money to solve a problem we can't solve because of the rules and regulations. <laughs> togetherness uh, more yeah. important than, you know. And just uh, for them to be brave. <laughs> um, have, how would you go ahead in this specific battle that Marlene is in, since you guys are all about at a Greener Festival with uh, tying bonds and joining hands? Uh, can you give some practical Well, tips? That's, that's the first time that I've heard about a battery not being allowed on a site, actually. And uh, you'd see, you'd be able to, I mean, what you're doing with bringing everybody together is the best approach in that situation, but also then taking the examples from just down the road, like, they've been using... No, it's it. super random, because some, it, it's, it's actually just comes down to which fireman you have in front of you. So some mm. of them, uh, there's not a, an official law in no. Holland that, like, prohibits or... Uh, says that it that, that it can be done, mm -hmm. so it's just about the matter of who's on the other side of the table. So it can happen that, like, 30 kilometers down the road, it, it is allowed, and then for mm -hmm. me, it's not allowed. And for me, it's a, it's a we are in the inner city of Groningen, and there are certain risks in using batteries. And the local fire department says, you know, if if this battery like explodes or. It, uh, has a fire, then we are in the inner city and we have to evacuate part of the city because of the toxic gases that, you know. And yeah. we've taken them to the supplier and we've shown them all of the, of the administration. And it's just a matter of, like, are they willing mm. to take the risk, like the tiny, 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 tiny risk that this thing catches mm. fire and they are not. 
Well, we used them on the Queen's Jubilee and the Queen's funeral. I think if they were a hazard, they wouldn't have been allowed in there. <laughs> so don't tell them this, but I put one on a dry on on a, a a driving truck, and I drove one working through the city of Groningen. Um, <laughs> Anarchy. <laughs> and nobody said anything, but um, I'm not allowed to do it during the festival. But another it's argument. Last, it's our last generator, so this is a big frustration for me. Uh, we. Uh, had all of the other generators, we had a different solution for that, so we uh, upgraded the mains or whatever, and the, then there's just one diesel generator at your Sonic Noderslag that I can't get rid of because mm. I can't use the battery. Funny that handling the fuels is going to be safer. Um, but another thing that you could use is the um, the council themselves. It doesn't sound like it's actually them making the decision, but... They, they are. They have the power to make the decision, so but they don't have the own, guts to make the decision. They'll have their own net zero strategy as well and things related to air pollution in the city. And so that's what we've found has really helped on trying to get the council on board. You're saying, like, you know those commitments that you've made publicly and that you're scratching your head over how to achieve it. We can help you to achieve it if we can do X, Y, Z. And then they're like, oh, great, we don't have to do anything. You'll do it for us. Yeah, so that's what we're trying to do now to together with the other festivals to have the conversation. But this is a, a really big frustration. So don't give me the money, just give me your, your support and uh, your thinking power. Let's talk, let's do this together. Uh, before we go ahead and have a moment for the Q&A because it's half past nine. Uh, the future, let's look at it. Um, let's talk about uh, the different parties and how they view the future starting with the fans, how do you think, as a performing artist, Bonus, um, the fans will uh, look at sustainability? Will they demand more and more of the artist uh, in the future, you think, or you hope? Um, yeah, I think so. I think that's just a general evolution and uh, music will not escape uh, that, I think. Uh, so, yes, and... Um, Although I, I, I think that th the biggest change we can make is with the audience. <laughs> uh, and and that w I, I wanted to, to say something about what governments can do uh, is like invest in public transport much more and see that people can get back with a train. Uh, but also just stop building houses everywhere. It's like, it's stop. amazing <laughs> what uh, how many new um, areas that, that uh, are being built now with just single family houses uh, and it's just a disaster. We, I, I suspect that I'm gonna live uh, the day that they have to like uh, uh, throw them down or, because if everyone lives everywhere you cannot organize public transport. Hey, we've got a fan. <laughs> I can back that up with uh, research results that say um, if you live in the countryside in, an, in a new house which is energy neutral, you still have a very big carbon footprint because of your, all of your mobility needs. It's better to live in the city in a half-half insulated house but live in a city. So that is really indeed but something. But if I live in the, in the countryside and I bike everywhere, is that okay? <laughs> yes, that's okay, but okay, but great. like uh, where I live, they're literally building. Uh, there's like a, there's a bridge which is too steep, and people that live on the other side of the bridge uh, from the it. center, they don't take the bike. So and they're building new areas there, and uh, you know that's all people who will use the car for everything for the stupid bridge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So remove the bridge. Or <laughs> That's good. Bridges can't be too steep in the future. <laughs> it's a good point. It's a very good point. Um, also, yeah, uh, looking at the government, uh, thank you for that um, as well. And I'm going to circle back to the fans uh, and the general attitude. Um, how do you guys uh, at a Greener Festival look at the evolution in the years to come? What's mm. What's coming? Make us happy because I love your <laughs> combative attitude. Okay, I'll just think differently for a second from what I was going to say. No, I was actually thinking about um, campsite waste and festivals, just to touch on that one quickly because bless the fans. Um, but we've had, uh, again, in the surveys, like they think that waste is a really big impact of events um, and yet would leave 
all of their stuff behind. But this is something that then gets pointed on festivals, but I think is a reflection of our kind of psychological problems as a society at the moment, the kind of gross overconsumption um, and lack of connection to what it is that we do and the materials that we come into contact with from fossil fuels to meat to plastic tents. You know, there's no connection and there's no kind of seeing that thread. So I think and hope that the future of fans and hence all people <laughs> um, is going to be that there is a complete awareness that value is put onto things in an appropriate way. So you can see what's happened with that animal that you're then eating and the impact that's had on the land. You can see the impact of fossil fuels and what it has on other communities normally, <laughs> not those that are happily going around to concerts. Um, and you can see that actually in every piece of but something that you choose to pick up and then chuck away, there's embodied water, carbon, and people's efforts within that. Um, but by then, we'll also not be living on a fossil fuel economy, and we'll have got rid of industrial agriculture <laughs> and abuse of animals, um, and we'll have fantastic, wonderful products that just last for our whole lifetime, and then we can pass them on to our happy little children as they bounce around the fields of joy. Um, yeah. So. If, if you're uh, talking about uh, uh, tents and, and waste uh, on festivals, I'm just wondering, aren't there any festivals that just provide tents for yeah, their... Yeah, and that's uh, a really great solution, actually. And it's something that's like a service and a sharing economy rather than a consumption economy. I think that's something that's going to become more prevalent as Cardboard well. Cardboard tents are also a thing. Kartenten? Yes, They're only called? if it doesn't rain, though. Yeah. Ah, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Practical yeah. stuff. No, they are waterproof, but you sort probably of. shouldn't have a bong in there. That could go yeah. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Final round. How hopeful are you for the future? Then we're going into the Q&A. So little reminder for everybody who's following it online uh, to put your question in the comments. And there's a mic that I'm going to pass in the hall as well. The future. Um, I'm... Um Frustrated but hopeful because the only uh, it's the only way you have to we have to be hopeful and so uh, yeah you can see a lot of change and uh, you can see how I think COVID was in that way a hopeful thing that to see like okay things can change even from one day to the next day if it's really necessary so I'm. Uh, Hopeful, <laughs> because if the I bridge think is not to too steep. <laughs> <laughs> so, on a scale of one to ten for the music industry, I think an eight. For the world, I think a six. Okay, but we pass. It's something. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to separate the numbers. Yeah. Mm, just the numbers. Okay. So, on the music industry, I think that if we start to have more decision makers that are from more diverse backgrounds, so that it's not all so funneled in one direction, that's clearly the wrong one, um, then we could be on a nine, ten. Um, and for the world, similarly, you know, start to actually listen to people that have been looking after and caring for the world for such a long time and give them the platform and the profile rather than going, we know the way. <laughs> no, you don't. Um, then I think it will be a ten. Eleven. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. <laughs> I'm not giving marks uh, tonight. I have to do that uh, too regularly. Yeah, come uh, on. Yeah. <laughs> no, but um, I, I also am uh, optimistic because of the changes that I see. Uh, and espe especially because it's bottom-up and uh, it's about the audience, but also in our, in our universities are the students who are putting pressure upon us also to change curricula and so on. Uh, and I think also that uh, applies to the government. Uh, I've been we have all been complaining about the governments. Our governments are going slower than uh, the general audience, even than some industries want to go. And in some, at some point, they will have to follow as well and take the lead in that. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about it. I think Europe is doing well, though. No. <laughs> I have a question. Well, actually, it's from Wart, and it's about Europe. Um, and I'm going to ask, first and foremost, if there's anybody in this audience that has a question, you can raise your hand. Perfect, we'll get the mic there. And in the meantime, I'm going to pop the question of Wart. Wart asks, is it doable to put up a touring sustainability permit on a European level, as in based on some important parameters, such as power, food, and transport, so you can get a green or a red light? 
to go on tour? This is a very good question. Who can pitch in on that, maybe from your perspective? So your would that be from a government? Is that European, on European on level. On a European, European level. Uh, yeah, government. It might, it might actually come to that, because if resources get so restricted that actually there's a quota on what you can and can't use, then it could come to that level. Whether it's a good idea, like I said before, having um, the, you're still operating within the macro environment, so... If, if the countries are doing that as well and the places that you're going to and it's a shared responsibility, then yes, it could work and you can work together towards it. Um, perhaps setting it as a, as a goal and a target in advance that at some point is going to become, become compulsory, that I think it could be a, quite a wise thing to do, actually. And happening almost, mm. you think? How realistic is it? How realistic is it to happen? Yes. Uh, <laughs> well... <laughs> I guess a lot of our old boys are going to be retiring soon, so yeah, it could, it could happen. <laughs> but I think Europe is doing also already a lot of things which is also affecting um, the music industry. When you, when you think about the circular economy package, that's all about plastic waste and the reduction of that, uh, recycled content and so on. That's not a choice uh, that you have as a venue or whatever. You have to follow those rules. Uh, so. It is already having a lot of impact, uh, energy as well. Transport is more left to, uh, to, the, to, 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 the, to the countries themselves or the regions. But uh, I, so I'm not sure whether it's really necessary to have a kind of European uh, system or permit system there for, for festivals because there are many other levers that Europe is already using to to steer, in fact, into the right direction for uh, all kinds of matter that are important for venues and for, uh, for concert tours. Mm -hmm. Hope that answers your question, Wart, who dropped it in the comments. Um, there was yes. somebody in the, in uh, the venue. I have a question or a suggestion uh, regarding waste uh, from uh, visitors on festivals. In uh, Germany, there is this festival, Fusion Festival. It's more an anarchist festival, but there, um, when you enter the, uh, the the camping, you get a waste bag, and if you bring the full uh, full waste bag back at the end of the festival, you get like I think 10 or 20 euros. So there is a, a an incentive to put all your waste in this bag and bring it back. So there is not like this like at the end of the because we we always stay a day later and there is not like a massive waste field. And I was wanted to ask what is your opinion on this type of systems, like putting the responsibility with the consumer, not with the festival, to deal with all the waste. And rewarding them. And the rewarding time. them. Uh, actually, I first saw that at VU Festival in 2003 in Putlitz, which is also in Germany. I was like, this is amazing. But then we ended up running around like trying to find other people's waste, because we didn't generate like two bags full of waste. I was like, I'm not creating this much waste. And then it became a competition to try and steal people's waste. So that's the one that's the one thing that if you're like for instance filling bags, then you then have to then make it's the waste. Already in the waste container and not Blowing yeah, around but then you don't get your deposit back, and I was like 21 then and ne needed my. But if you bring back the bag, <laughs> it does, the bag doesn't need to be full. You just need to bring back the bag. Okay, cool. I think that the incentives are really good, and also to um, uh, there's another thing that happened recently where they're tagging tents on the way yeah. in, so that you like we know it's yours. Big Brother is watching you, yeah. and it's kind of double-edged in a way because it's supposed to be a free, liberating experience, not a surveillance uh, exercise at an event. But you do get quite infuriated when people do leave mountains of waste. But I do wonder with fusion as well because it's quite an anarchist like, festival and people have got um, like a certain mindset. Yeah, then. But but yeah, it's, it has become a bit more mainstream in the last few okay. years. So yeah. yeah, I think actually for camping, uh, for festival campsites, the tents are a bigger problem than the waste, because a lot of tents and sleeping bags are being left there, um, and so some are in good shape and you can donate, which happens, but uh, not all of them. <laughs> and it seems like people are using tents as a throwaway article, so they buy a tent just for the festival and then they leave it there which is crazy. <laughs> so if you go to a camping festival, please take your tent back and use it the next year and the next and the next. <laughs> hope that answers your question. We've yes. got a question. I oh, know it was just somebody scratching the head. <laughs> uh, is there anybody in, the, in this audience with a question left? It's a now or never opportunity. Pass the mic. 
Thank you. A very interesting. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, I have a question, like we're talking about greener and so on, but we have like 17 sustainability development goals. So should we not stress also the positive impact of events on well-being, on promoting diversity, of creating awareness? Huh? If, you, if you just can motivate your, your, your visitors and get them intrinsic motivated of going on doing something, I think there are, there's also very positive things on festivals and events. And we're stressing always like negative carbon print and so on and reducing things. So I think festivals are also, also a way of promoting flourishing, flourishing goals and so on. So what do you think about that? Yeah, that's true. Thank you. I think, uh, uh, as we said before, festivals are a really good way to, to reach people and to uh, inspire them. and to make them happy and I think that's really important too yeah and it's an experimentation ground I okay. think uh, it was at a festival that I tried my first cricket okay. I didn't like you it but anyway <laughs> me too <laughs> <laughs> a fried cricket very tasty yeah. by the way yeah. I mean it is I mean, the festivals especially are an opportunity for you to give a glimpse of what that future could be You've got a chance to create a different place and a different experience where, for instance, you could have the completely vegan menu, the renewable energy, and people being free to be who they are without being judged or imprisoned. You know, and it's a, it's a perfect opportunity for that, for connecting with nature and each other in a community, which is something that we've been so separated from, that sense of community, and hence our sense of being part of nature, which is why we're in a terrible pickle. <laughs> so I think it's, yeah, you've hit the nail on the head with that. Um, but also you could really see the impact of not having music events or any kind of like, gatherings on people's mental health and well-being during COVID. And it was something that was not necessarily recognised as being a real important service to society because of the fact that we don't live in a communal way so much now. We're very much isolated in our individual little worlds, which are highly consuming <laughs> to fill the hole <laughs> that's like, you know, that can be filled through events. And it's Events are a important. necessity. Mm, exactly preaching to the choir here <laughs> definitely <laughs> and this also relates to what you said about music the music industry about not being uh, the conservative mm. party well it has always been uh, the place of innovation mm. and the place where something happens and boils and where true change happens and I think that all of you guys here on stage were a perfect example of that if there's not an urgent question that's being yelled from the audience Right now, I'm gonna say thank you so much for the expertise, the wonderful answers, the glimpses of hope, uh, and the very uh, uh, real <laughs> problem of steep bridges in Flanders <laughs> of addressing that as well. It's been uh, a wonderful panel, and uh, let's conclude with a very big applause for Johan Ekmans, Claire O'Neill, Marlene Bode, and Bonas Kapel. Michel Tuvli. <laughs>